My name is Bob Newton. I'm the interim director of the Church in the 21st Century Center. I'm also a special assistant to the uh, president of Boston College, Father Leahy. And I'd like to uh, welcome you tonight, or this, this afternoon, I guess, to uh, today's event. Uh, as most of you know, and if you don't have a copy of the C21 resources, uh, there are copies in the back on the table, that our theme for this semester is the Eucharist at the center of Catholic life. And uh, all of the programs, including tonight's program, practically all of the programs, uh, are on that same theme, uh, the Eucharist at the center of Catholic life. Uh, next semester, C21 Resources will have a cognate theme, which will be Catholics, a sacramental people. Uh, this issue was edited by Father John Baldwin of the uh, School of Theology and Ministry, and next semester's issue will also be guest ed edited by uh, Father Baldwin. Uh, let me introduce a member, will be brief, of uh, the Church in the 21st Century Advisory Committee, who will introduce our guest speaker tonight. Uh, Kevin A. Hearn is a doctoral candidate in the, the theological ethics in the theology department here at Boston College. After graduating from Fordham in 2003, Kevin was elected to a four-year term as the international president of the International Movement of Catholic Students, Pax Romana, a global network of national Catholic student associations in over 80 countries. Two other facts about Kevin, and then I'll stop. In 2008, Kevin published The Radical Bible with Orbis Books. And Kevin was an honor guard during the funeral services of blessed Pope John Paul II and stood for two hours uh, next to the body of blessed John Paul II as he lay in state. So, Kevin. Thank you. It's my real honor and privilege this evening uh, to introduce to you uh, His Eminence Car Cardinal Sean Patrick O'Malley. Uh, Cardinal O'Malley was born on June 29th in 1944 in Lakewood, Ohio, and was raised in Western Pennsylvania. At the age of 12, then named Patrick O'Malley, entered the, uh, the, the minor seminary, entered a minor seminary. At 21, he was professed into the orders of Friars Minor Capuchin, and at 26, he was ordained a Catholic priest. After earning a master's degree in religious education and a PhD in Spanish and Portuguese literature from Catholic University of America, he taught at CUA and founded the Hispanic Catholic Center in Washington, an organization which provided educational, medical, and legal help to immigrants. Since his ordination to the Episcopacy on August 2nd, 1984, he has served as the Bishop of the Diocese of St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands, Fall River in Massachusetts, Palm Beach in Florida, and then in, in 2003, Blessed John Paul II appointed him as Archbishop of Boston in July. Pope Benedict XVI named him a Cardinal in 2006. As of September uh, 2011, O'Malley is the only Capuchin member of the College of Cardinals. In June 2010, His Eminence was named along with others to oversee the apostolic visitation of certain dioceses and seminaries in Ireland, and he was especially responsible for the Archdiocese of Dublin and its suffragan sees. Uh, and Cardinal O'Malley, who prefers to go by the name of Cardinal Sean, is known for his love and commitment to the poor, his joyful demeanor, and his absolute devotion to others. And these are virtues that I'm sure will be made known to us in his lecture this evening on the Eucharist at the center of Catholic life. Your eminence, please. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great joy and a privilege to be here today. And First of all, I want to express publicly my gratitude to uh, Boston College and particularly to Father Leahy uh, for all that he does to promote the Catholic identity of this university 
and all that he has done to help us revitalize Catholic education uh, in the Archdiocese of Boston. When I was a seminarian, our provincial, Father Victor, wrote a letter to Rome in which he said that our mission in Puerto Rico was flourishing and that our province was prepared to take on a second mission. And he said that he wanted it to be the most difficult mission in the world. The response was lightning quick, saying that we should open the mission in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. The guardian, Father Furman Schmidt, from Capuchin College in Washington, was named the first bishop, and friars were sent. Three of my classmates went. It was reported back when the friars landed in the field in the highlands of New Guinea. The natives came out, who had never seen Europeans before, were very curious about the airplane. And so through an interpreter, they asked whether the airplane was male or female. They said, if it's a female, we want an egg. <laughs> Many years later, a young friar ordained who was working in Papua New Guinea came to see me on his home visit. He had glorious pictures of the smiling natives with bones in their noses, feathers in their hair, and little else in the way of clothing. He announced proudly, this is my parish council. I was particularly intrigued because one of my own pastors had just told me that his parishioners were not ready for a parish council. <laughs> in the same vein, at World's Youth, World Youth Day in Cologne, Pope Benedict, addressing the bishops in Germany, referred to his native country, Germany, as a mission land. This is true for so many places in the Western world, including our own beloved country. I often wonder that if today Father Victor had written to Rome and said, send us to the most difficult mission in the world, they may have written back and said, you're already there. We need to find new ways of bringing the gospel to the contemporary world of proclaiming Christ anew and implanting the faith. As Pope Benedict said, we're not here just for the existing church. We are to be a missionary church. Our task is to turn consumers into disciples and disciple makers. We need to prepare men and women who witness to the faith and do not send people into the witness protection program. As the bishops wrote in Go Make Disciples, every Catholic can be a minister of welcome, reconciliation, and understanding to those who have stopped practicing the faith. In the new millennium, business as usual is not enough. We must be a team of missionaries moving from maintenance mode to a missionary one. We must ask ourselves, what does it mean to live surrounded by a culture of unbelief? A culture which does not even know that it doesn't believe because it still lives on in the residue of Christian civilization. As Stanley Hauros expressed it so well, the church exists today as resident aliens an adventuresome colony in a society of unbelief. As a society of unbelief, Western culture is devoid of a sense of journey, of adventure, because it lacks belief in much more than the cultivation of an ever-shrinking horizon of self-preservation and self-expression. To be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ in the Catholic Church is much more than a head trip. It's a way of life together. The whole person is engaged in the process. Education for this journey must therefore be experiential, personal, 
engaging, and life-giving. We learn dis discipleship in the way that we learn a language, by living in a community that speaks that language. Our young Catholics must be mentored in the faith by others, either peers or older Catholics who are walking the walk. We are very blessed by the fact that our present Holy Father, Pope Benedict XVI, is a man of extraordinary intellectual capacity and a deep understanding and love for academia, a true man of the university, as was his predecessor, Blessed John Paul II. Indeed, when John Paul II wrote Ex Corde Ecclesiae, we see glimpses of his love for the life of the university. He writes, for many years I myself was deeply enriched by the beneficial experience of university life, the ardent search for truth and its unselfish transmission to youth and to all those learning to think rigorously so as to act rightly and to serve humanity better. The Holy Father describes the university's privileged task to unite the two orders of reality that are too frequently placed in opposition to each other, the search for truth and the certainty of already knowing the font of truth. The Catholic community needs our institutions of higher learning to be venues of evangelization and faith formation. In the past, there was often the presumption that young people came to our universities fully catechized and initiated into the life of the Catholic community. We have discovered that that is not necessarily the case. Today, I hope it is obvious to all that young Catholics often lack that catechetical formation and need to find a welcoming faith community in the university. I'm very comforted when I meet every year with our six Catholic college presidents who assure me that although there is much religious illiteracy, they have never experienced a generation more open to the faith. Therefore, I urge always our Catholic colleges and universities to provide our Catholic students with an opportunity to learn about their faith. And today I had an opportunity to learn about what BC is doing. Nothing is sadder than when our own institutions, those who have the responsibilities of teaching the faith, present the magisterium in a dismissive or condescending way and fail to recognize the profound philosophical and theological traditions that are part of the treasury of Catholicism. I am so pleased that the, the Church of the 21st century here has made one of its themes, the Catholic intellectual life. As your pastor, I want to share with you a deep concern expressed so often by our priests, deacons, religious, and lay leaders, namely, the crisis of absenteeism at the Sunday Eucharist. This needs to be one of the focal points of pastoral concern for all who love the church. Our Catholic colleges have the unique opportunity and I dare say responsibility to help us address this problem. The Pew study has indicated that it is in the late teens and early 20s the young Catholics will make those commitments and decisions that will affect their practice of the faith for the rest of their lives. That is precisely the demographic which is in our universities and in the military service. As an archdiocese, we have tried to dedicate as many resources as possible to this group of young people. We are probably the diocese that sends the most chaplains to the armed forces. And I'm told that there could be almost a half a million university students within the Archdiocese of Boston, a large percentage of them being Catholic. The last two years, we brought focus ministry to work at two of the universities, and our university chaplains are working very hard to make the church present on the campus. And today, I had an opportunity to meet with your chaplain 
and hear about the wonderful things happening here at BC. After much consultation with the priests, religious, and lay leaders, I am poised to publish a pastoral letter on the Sunday Eucharist. I see this as an important continuation of the initiatives such as Arise, Catholics Come Home, and Why Catholic. I'm counting on our university communities to partner with us in our efforts to incorporate all of our Catholics into a worshiping community. The message is a crucial one for our future as a church, and I invite all of you to be heralds of that message. When I was bishop in the West Indies, on the island where I lived, we had the oldest synagogue in the Western Hemisphere. It had been built by Sephardic Jews in what was then the Danish West Indies. One day the rabbi invited me to come and take a tour of the synagogue. It was a lovely old West Indian building with sand on the floor and in the ark they had a magnificent ancient Torah, Torah scroll that had been brought there by the Sephardic Jews. As I walked around the synagogue, I picked up a prayer book that just happened to open to an ancient Jewish prayer that began with the words, more than Israel has kept the Sabbath, the Sabbath has kept Israel. I was amazed and I said to myself, the same is true for us of the new covenant. More than we have kept the Sunday mass obligation, it has kept us a people focused on God, united to one another and with a sense of mission. Recently, I was at a benefit dinner, something bishops do quite regularly, contributing abundantly to our girth. <laughs> at this particular event, a principal from a Catholic high school was being honored. And in his acceptance speech, he said, I grew up in a family where going to Mass on Sunday was about as optional as breathing. The statement got quite a rise out of the audience because I believe many of us could identify with those words. And it wasn't a matter of authoritarian parents necessarily or social pressure, but rather a sense of how important the Sunday Eucharist is for our own identity and survival. In his first Apologia, addressed to the Emperor Antoninus and to the Senate of Rome, St. Justin proudly described the Christian practice of the Sunday assembly. During the persecution of Diocletian, those assemblies were banned with the greatest severity. Many were courageous enough to defy the imperial decree and accepted death rather than miss the Sunday Eucharist. One of the responses of the accused has been often quoted, Emeritus, who declared that Christians had met in his house, and when he was asked why he violated the emperor's command, he said, sine domenico non possumus. In other words, we can't live without Sunday. When I was a seminarian, I remember reading an interview with Flannery O'Connor, they were asking her what it was like to grow up Catholic in the South. Obviously, there were so few Catholics there, particularly in those days, and many prejudices against Catholics. In this interview, Flannery O'Connor talks about her best friend when she was a little girl, a little Baptist girl. Flannery kept inviting her to accompany her to Mass. Finally, the little girl got permission from her mom to go to Mass with Flannery. Flannery couldn't wait for the Mass to be over so she could ask her, well, what did you think? What did you think? And the little girl said, wow. She said, you Catholics really have something special. The sermon was so boring. Said, the music was so bad. The priest was mumbling in that language nobody could understand, and all those people were there. Obviously, they were not there to be entertained. 
And I'm sure that most of them there were there because sine domenico non potuerunt. The truth is, the Catholic Church sprang up around the Eucharist. Christ commanded us, do this in memory of me. And ever since, we have been doing this, celebrating his Eucharist, changing bread and wine into his body and blood so that the Good Shepherd can continue to feed his flock. I was pleased that this year's On Mission Sunday, by chance, the gospel was the great commandment. I fear often when we think of Christian charity and Christian love and love of neighbor, we think only of feeding the hungry, caring for the sick and the elderly, providing for the homeless and the poor. But if we truly love our neighbor, we will likewise be very concerned that there are many people who are spiritually homeless, spiritually hungry, spiritually imprisoned, and spiritually sick. The church exists to evangelize, to announce the good news of God's love and his desire that we follow him as part of his people. Discipleship, as I always say, is never a solo flight, but rather an adventure that we live together. And at the heart of that adventure is the Eucharistic banquet, where Calvary and the Last Supper become present in our life and our history. When I was a young priest in Washington, they dedicated the Kennedy Center Jackie Kennedy had invited Leon Bernstein to compose a piece for the opening performance, and he wrote his famous Mass. One scene in particular was the source of much comment at the time. At a very emotional climax, with growing cacophony of the choruses, the celebrant in a furious rage hurls the chalice to the floor. The whole image of Bernstein's mass, I believe, resonates with the story of Moses going up Mount Sinai to receive the tablets of the law. And when he comes down and sees the community in disarray and worshiping the golden calf, he cast the tablets on the ground and broke them. Bernstein, a Jew, had no doubt incorporated this image into his mass, having the celebrant cast down the chalice, being like Moses smashing the tablets of the law at the sight of God's people worshiping the golden calf. When people are not worshiping God, they begin to worship the golden calf. They begin to find many false gods, money, power, pleasure. If we love God with our whole mind and our whole heart and our whole strength, we must not turn our back on his commandments to keep holy the Lord's day. In a society that is highly individualistic, as described in Professor Putnam's Bowling Alone, where he shows how each successive generation of Americans spends more time alone, eating alone, living alone, spending hours alone before a television or a computer screen. We must communicate that discipleship means being part of Jesus' family, part of a community. In a culture that's addicted to entertainment, some Christian churches have turned themselves into entertainment centers. In the Eucharist, we have something much more important than entertainment. We have love taken to the extreme. Our God has made a gift of himself to us, and in, he invites us to wash each other's feet and to make a gift of our lives to God and to one another. When I learned that the Eucharist, the center of Catholic life, was your theme, I was very, very happy. 
Certainly, in these days, in most of our parishes, they're preparing for the introduction of the new Missal. It gives all of us an opportunity to focus on the Eucharist again. I know that the initial reaction of many priests was less than enthusiastic for any changes in the Missal, but I hope that all of us who have used this opportunity to help reintroduce our people to what is most central in our lives, the Sunday Mass. One year ago, we revamped our pre-Cana course here at the Archdiocese, and Carrie Kalala and her committee did a stunning job. I'd asked them to include more catechetical content into the weekend. But what surprised all of us as we conducted the pilot weekends was the evaluation forms came back saying that what the young couples enjoyed the most about the weekend was the opportunity to be at a teaching mass. That certainly brought home to us that many of our young Catholics do not have a firm grasp of the meaning of the Eucharist and at the same time are anxious to learn. The publication of the new Missal, I think, gives us a unique opportunity. We are always anxious to have the very best preaching and music for the liturgy. We all want to see the Mass celebrated with dignity and beauty. We're anxious for people to understand the meaning of the rites and the rich history of our tradition. But all of that is not enough. We need to teach people how to pray. Only then will the Mass make sense. Only then will we be, begin to penetrate the mystery. Now, as a quasi-graduate of Boston College, I got an honorary degree here a few years ago. <laughs> I'm very fond of our college seal. The coat of arms and mottos of various universities and cities have always fascinated me. Many people, I'm sure, would be very surprised that the secular and sophisticated city of Boston has as its motto, Sicut patribus sit Deus nobis. May God be for us as he was to our ancestors. As most of you know, the motto on the seal of BC is in both Greek and Latin. I think to outdo Harvard, which is only in Latin. And just in case anyone doubted the erudition of the Jesuit fathers. Under the JIS, which are actually the Greek letters, first letters of the name of Jesus, are the words in Greek, Ein apistuein, ever to excel, which comes from Homer's Iliad on the lips of Glaucus, who is revealing his identity to Diomedes. The Latin words below specify where we are to excel. Religioni et bonis artibus. And so it reads, ever to excel in religion and in the good arts. Naturally, we all want BC to excel in the good sciences and to beat Notre Dame and do many other things. But religion is mentioned first. An important way to measure our success in evangelizing and forming a new generation of disciples has to be how faithful we are to the Sunday Eucharist. With the strength that comes from the Word of God broke open at Mass in the community, from the witness of our brothers and sisters in the faith, it's hard to imagine how someone can persevere in a life of discipleship. The metaphor of the vine and the branches is most apt. A branch cut off from the vine cannot survive very long. And so in today's world, where the values of the gospel are often dismissed out of hand, where religion is trivialized, and where political correctness trumps even the supremacy of conscience, in such a society, only those Catholics who pray and come to Mass 
are going to persevere in their vocation to be Jesus' disciples in the Catholic Church. When we issue the pastoral letter on the Sunday Eucharist, we hope that our parishes, as well as other communities, such as our schools and universities, will seriously consider best practices for pastoral outreach to those who have stepped away from the Sunday Eucharist. As a young priest training couples for marriage, I always stress the importance of the family meal. I look back at my own childhood and recall how each night we gathered, the children, my parents, and my grandmother that lived with us for the evening meal. It was a time of great give and take. We recounted both sad and funny things that may have happened to us during the day. We shared ideas and aspirations, but most importantly, we shared each other. And prayer was always part of the equation, grace before meals and often the rosary after dinner. As a child, there were many places I would rather have been, playing outside or visiting friends or whatever. And as they say, the shortest book in the world is the Irish cookbook. <laughs> Boil everything and serve it with a potato. <laughs> However, looking back, I realized that those dinners with the O'Malley clan is where we learned our own identity and forged bonds for a lifetime. There, we shared our stories, and our individual stories were woven into the history that we share together. By the same token, our celebration of the Eucharist, the sacrifice of the Mass, is for us Catholics a family meal. It is there that we experience God's love. We learn our own identity, who we are, why we're in this world, and what we have to do with our lives. Not going to Mass is to stop breathing, stop breathing the life of the body of Christ. In the Gospel, Jesus tells the parable of the man who sends his servants out to call the invitees to a wedding banquet. It's not an easy assignment. Some of them got beaten up rather badly. We need to overcome our own reticence at times and get up enough nerve to say to a friend or an associate, would you like to come to Mass with me on Sunday? Believe it or not, there are many people who are just waiting for an invitation and aren't going to hit you around the head and neck with a blunt instrument. Part of the way that we will ever excel is by, be, by being part of a worshiping community. We would not want anyone to graduate from BC who did not experience here the great truth that the Eucharist is at the center of our lives as Catholics. All of us need to do much more in our parishes and in our schools to make people feel welcomed, to feel invited and supported in their faith. We must help our students and faculty to discover the great treasure of the Sunday Eucharist. Our ideal is to make the Sunday Eucharist our Sabbath, a great school of charity, justice, and peace. As we read in the encyclical Dies Domini, the presence of the risen Lord in the midst of his people becomes an undertaking of solidarity, a compelling force for inner renewal, an inspiration to change the structures of sin in which individuals, communities, and at times, entire peoples are entangled. Far from being an escape, the Christian Sunday is a prophecy inscribed on time itself, a prophecy obliging the faithful to follow in the footsteps of the one who came to preach the good news to the poor, to proclaim release to captives and new sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. We all realize that we have made, we realize that some have made the choice to stop coming to church because they've been hurt by the actions of someone in the church or because of a difficulty with the church's teaching. 
from my first day as Archbishop and perhaps for the rest of my life, I will always be asking forgiveness for those who've been hurt by the actions or inactions of our people and our leaders in the church. We do not want those experiences to separate anyone from the love of Christ and our Catholic family or prevent anyone from receiving the grace of the sacraments. When we launched the Catholics Come Home program on Ash Wednesday, a reporter asked me what I would say to Catholics who did not attend Mass because they disagree or have some questions about church teaching. I had to say that the teachings of the church do not change because people disagree with them. Our faith comes from Christ's own teaching in the scriptures. However, we recognize that many struggle to reconcile church teaching with social norms in American society today. And we need to engage in a meaningful conversation with them. We want them to know and feel that they are part of our family. We care about them. We want to listen to their experience and share ours with them. More importantly, we want to assure them that God loves them and awaits them at Mass. It's the best place to begin that conversation with a family of believers in a worshiping community. Prayer, the witness of faith, and the power of the sacraments help to strengthen our faith. Last Saturday at the Cathedral of the Holy Cross, we celebrated the feast of our newly beatified Pope John Paul II. It was a glorious celebration with many priests and faithful gathered for the occasion. How fitting that his first feast day should be on the eve of Mission Sunday. John Paul II was the greatest missionary of our age. He was seen and heard by more people than any other human being in the history of the world. His great passion and love was for young people. He initiated the World Youth Days and gathered millions of young Catholics around the world, even when he was crippled with Parkinson's and bent over with age. His great mantra was, do not be afraid. He delivered that message to oppress people throughout the world, in Poland, the Philippines, Chile, Haiti, Paraguay, and Cuba. He presented to our young people the liberating force of the gospel and showed them how beautiful a life of discipleship can be. Let us overcome every fear and reticence to reach out to our young people with trust and with great respect and invite them to be part of our worshiping community. Let us never tire of, to make our Catholic family a welcoming and inviting community where all have the opportunity to be mentored in the faith and experience the joy of following Jesus Christ by making a gift of their lives to God and to others. During this time that you have dedicated for the reflection on the Eucharist, I urge everyone to never pass up the opportunity to encourage our young people to be a part of the worshiping community. I hope that my pastoral letter and the various activities around Catholics Come Home in the Archdiocese will be helpful to the BC community as you ponder ways to encourage both students and faculty to gather together each Sunday with the community of faith and the Eucharist, which is the source and summit of our church. For each of us, Sunday is the day of the resurrection. On that first Easter, Jesus appeared to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. The disciples were confused, hurt, full of fear and doubts. They were trying to determine what to make of the death of Jesus and the empty tomb. They discussed these developments when Jesus, whom they did not recognize, drew near and began to speak with them. When they reached the village, they invited Jesus to stay with them. St. Luke says that at that moment, Jesus made as if he were going to continue on his journey. 
It was their invitation that brought Jesus to the table. The Lord is always waiting for us to invite him into our lives. When they sat down for the evening meal, Jesus took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and began to give it to them. At that point, the disciples recognized Jesus. Suddenly, he vanished, but the bread remains. Then the disciples rush back to Jerusalem to tell the apostles that Jesus had truly risen and appeared to them. We too live in times where many people are confused and hurt and full of fear. Jesus wants to meet us in the same way he met the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Like them, we will recognize Jesus and encounter him most profoundly in the breaking of the bread at Mass. The Eucharist is the fulfillment of Jesus' promise to be with us until the end of time. I pray that our love for the Mass and the Eucharistic amazement will increase so that our hearts will be burning within us when we hear the sacred scriptures proclaimed and observe the breaking of the bread. Let us do what those disciples on the road to Emmaus did. Let us rush out to tell the world that Christ is alive and that our family must gather at the Lord's table to experience God's love, to learn our own identity, and to fulfill our mission together, to say to the world, we have seen the Lord, and we have recognized him in the breaking of the bread. God bless you.